Now, ladies and gentlemen, the clue to our session was in the tune. Money, money, money. Um, I'm delighted to welcome on stage with me Emily Haekner, who is the head of uh, Scorecard at Summit. And my yeah. name is Hedley Aylott. I'm the founder and CEO of Summit. And in the next 30 minutes, we are going to talk about money. How to make more money from online retailing and doing it better than people do today. Now, as you came in, maybe you were given one of these. Did you all get one? Perfect. And in this report is the clue to making more money. And we're going to take you through some of our findings from a look around the world of how people are engaging their customers and selling in different parts of the world. But we spent the last 17 years trying to make our clients more money. And during that time, we've come across all sorts of things that retailers do to either make it easy or more difficult for people to shop. And we've created what we call a scorecard, a scorecard that looks across a number of points, factors that drive profitability and growth. And we've provided and developed a comparative score. And this afternoon, we want to take you through our view of the world, a global look at retail around the world online, and tell you what we found. But firstly, I want to play you a short video which for all of us at the Summit articulates perhaps some of the frustrations that we come across when looking across the world of online retailing. Let me share it with you. Hey, just that, thanks. Are you sure? Uh, yeah. Username? Oh, uh, Nick M? No. NM1983? No. I, uh, Zandy Pops? Sorry. <coughs> Zandy Pops? No, OK. Don't worry, I'll help. What's your postcode? Oh, it's a GU749ZT. Welcome back, Nick Forever. Oh, okay. Please listen carefully to this bread licence agreement before continuing with your purchase of a loaf of bread. If you do not, blah, blah, blah. You also agree not to use any bread-based products for any purposes prohibited by United Kingdom law, including without limitation of design, development, manufacture of missiles, chemical, nuclear or biological weapons. Tick. I'm afraid you've timed out. What? Sorry, Hello? Excuse me. Oh, yeah, hey. Just one loaf, sir? Yeah, we just... What's your username? It's uh, Nick Forever, but number four, not the... Gotcha. Yeah. OK, I'm just going to check that you're a real person. Could you say that for me? That's not even a word. OK, how about this one? You know what, forget it. it, it or really... this one? Uh, Hippopotamice. You're in. Great, I'm in. £8.85. It's supposed to be 98 pence. Plus express delivery. What's that? Oh, well, it's express delivery. It's fast. So there's, um... Standard. Oh, standard. Standard delivery. That's £4.99. Why? Bread insurance. You didn't untick the don't decline bread insurance option. You know what? I think I'll risk it. It is quite close to the sell-by date. Don't care. 98 pence it is. If you want to pop back in five business days, it'll be ready for your collection. Well, well, well I need it now, obviously. Oh, OK. Uh, you want the take-home today price? Well, that's £3.27. You know what, I'm going to go. Come back soon. I won't. So I hope you enjoyed that video. But for us, that just epitomizes um, some, of the, some of the worst experiences. But I suppose we have a question, which is, you know, why do we make it difficult for people? And what we've done is we've taken some of those things that made you laugh, because you've all been through that experience, and we've done that across a whole number of retailers uh, across the world. And let's explain how we scored and how we think about that poor man's experience. When you're online retailing, there are four things you need to do, however big or small you are. First of all, you need some e-commerce technology to uh, allow people to buy from you. You need some online marketing to bring you closer to your customers. You need some trading to range price and merchandise your business. And finally, you need to ship the product to somebody and get paid. And we set our retailers that we scored four questions. Firstly, the first question, how easy is it to buy from you? The second question, how close are you to your customers? The third question, how appealing are you to your customers? And the fourth question, do you delight your customers? And under each one of those four questions, we've broken down it into a subset of things that we looked for. And in this case, um, we've looked all over the world and we've scored 50 retailers. And I just wanted a snapshot to talk about some interesting things that what we found around the world. Firstly, it's interesting that 
In the UK, a small, warm, wet island of 63 million people, well, nearly 93% of that population are shopping online. Interestingly, uh, as Eric Schmidt said, it's the most sophisticated market for e-commerce in the world, highly competitive. But where is the growth coming from? Well, China, 650-odd million people online, another 700 million to go, looking at nearly 200% increase in e-commerce in the next two years alone. Huge. Second to that, Australia, smaller market, just a slightly fewer number of people, but still a spectacular growth forecast for Australia. And if we compare that to uh, Russia, again, e-commerce is on a huge rise in Russia over the next couple of years. So interesting places to, to place their bets. What will happen is the speed of evolution will be much quicker. And finally, if we compare it to uh, the US, US lags behind those three, uh, those three in, uh, huge growth numbers with about 57%. So we took retailers who are shopping and selling online, and we scored them. And what we got was a league table, which is broken down to the top 25 and the bottom 25. The winners and losers, or the could do betters, depends how you look at it. But take your time and have a look. And what we're going to do is take you through what we found and what got you a good score and what got you perhaps a less good score. So if we look by country, who did best? Actually, what was interesting is those red lines are all very similar. However, we took over three retailers in each country. So out of the retailers we scored, where there were more than three retailers or three or more in each country, the UK came out on top. But I think for me, what was interesting is there's a lot of similarity in terms of the, the, the countries. Um, but, 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 there is a but. When we look at the questions and how they scored, there are some areas where there's a huge room for improvement. And Emily's going to tell us exactly where. So, the first question we asked, how easy is it to buy from you? We looked at three things. We looked at the user experience. We actually went and shopped those websites, and we scored them against a whole number of criteria. Their search, their home page, their product pages, and their checkout, and their mobile experience. We measured their performance. How did they perform on desktop? How quick were they on mobile? And finally, we looked to see if there were any errors in their website using freely available tools. And it perhaps wouldn't surprise you to find there were hundreds and hundreds of errors which slow sites down and make sites difficult to render in browsers. But let's come on to what we found. So, Emily, um, what did we find? We found 64% of people, that was their average score across this category. So out of a possible 100. So there was a large room for improvement here. And if we look at the, uh, the findings, there were a whole number of themes, Emily. So what did we find? Well, interestingly, e-commerce technology was actually our highest scoring area across the value chain. And I put that down to the fact that nowadays people can buy just a certain number of platforms and get packages for that. So really, anybody who's able of a size is able to get that package. And really, it's about what you do um, with your site after that. What we found the biggest areas of struggle were were guest checkout. So only 40% of our retailers that we scored as part of the 50 global retailers offered a guest checkout as part of their um, checkout process. We also found that site speed was also an issue. So um, mobile was actually a lot um, slower than desktop. Um, and overall, we actually found that 60% of the retailers scored were actually a lot um, slower than the average benchmark of um, three seconds. So basically, if you're not loading your page in three seconds, no one's going to be interested, and they're just going to leave your site. Do you think that? Um when we looked across the whole set of retailers, how many of them were slower than three seconds? At 60%. Yeah, but how many, if we looked at, if we looked at the, across all of their pages, it was a large amount, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, so home page, we typically find that the home page loads a lot slower than the other pages, and this is due to the images that um, retailers choose to put on their site. So I don't know if some of you in this room maybe have um, conversations with design teams in terms of high-resolution images and making your home page look the best that it can, but I'd also recommend that as when you're doing that, you also um, take into consideration the speed of the site and where you can optimize that to make it as best as possible. And um, what did we need? What, what were we looking for? What did you need to do to score well? 
Well, as part of the checkout process, we were looking for an isolated checkout. So basically, as soon as you've got a customer who wants to go through and purchase, you really need to get them to purchase, and you don't want to distract them too much on that journey. So it's all about getting that conversion. We also look at the ability to guest checkout. So I know a lot of retailers look at the checkout as an area where we can have a lot of data capture, but really we would just recommend doing that at other stages, such as email sign-up, and basically offering a guest checkout um, just for the convenience of the user, really. Um, we also look for clear layout, and we also look for secure URLs, so um, making sure that the user knows that they're purchasing from a secure site, and they know that their details aren't going to get lost as part of that. Great. OK, so we've got some examples here to show you what BAD looks like. Some of the people oh, yeah, trying the sites. Okay, so I'm just going to proceed to the checkout to try and buy it. OK, so on the checkout page, um, it looks like it's only given me two options. One option to sign in uh, as an existing customer or to create an account. So let's just click join us. OK, so it's not giving the option for a guest checkout. It looks like I've got to sign up and create a password. Usually I'm pretty against doing this because I just think it's going to spam me with loads of emails and it's just another password for me to, to remember. So as it's a one-off purchase, I don't think I'll be buying much from H&M. Um, I think I'll probably just leave because I can probably get the shirt somewhere else where I can just do it quickly. Okay, so I need a size 8. Choose size. Oh, extra small, small, medium, large. So, do I want an extra small or do I want a small? So I can only get the extra small now. Small, I have to wait a week. Let's see if this one will work. Dresses, no. Jeans, no. Tops, jeans, no knitwear. Tops. Okay, small, extra small. Small, extra small. No. So just UK sizes. International. Petite, tall, that doesn't help. Nightwear. No size guard for this. Hmm. So two examples where um, we've got uh, 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 users, where we've observed them doing tasks. And this is a really, really good way of identifying what we call speed bumps within the user journey. So let's move on and look at online marketing. So this question was, how close are you to your customers? And for the retailers that we scored, there were three particular things we looked at. One was their visibility in search, because it's such an enormous starting point as a journey for many customers purchasing. We looked at social media from a point of view of engagement and reach. And finally, we looked at how well people were representing their brand online. So, Emily, what did we find? So, actually, online marketing was the lowest scoring pillar across everything that we scored. So this was the area that we saw there was the most room for improvement across all the retailers, um, with an average score of 51%. As you can see um, from the sides, 36% of the retailers scored actually declined in the Google um, rankings. So when we s talk about search visibility, we look at the keywords that a retailer would be able to show for within search, and then we um, give a percentage of how much of that search a retailer actually has. Um, and as you can see, 36% declined. And just to be clear, we're talking here about the natural rankings, the yes. rankings that Google decides on where people should be for their products. Yeah, yep. so it's all about relevancy in order to rank on the first pages um, of Google search, and that's what we were looking for here. Great. Um, brand was another area. So um, brand search is really important for customers to be able to find you. So obviously, as a retailer, if you type in your brand name, um, for example, Tesco's, you would want Tesco's to be on all the results on the first page of um, a search um, to make it all about yourself. Um, so over half of the retailers were actually losing out to online sales. And we saw that this was um, due to a lot of paid activity as well. So maybe not utilizing um, paid media on a brand search as well as they could do. 
Um, and also supermarkets actually outperform fashion retailers when it comes to social media engagement. So you might find that um, to be quite interesting as obviously you look to social, um, fashion retailers to be quite forward thinking in terms of social media, but actually it was the supermarkets and grocery sector that were really outshining there. Now this is a really interesting point. Everybody, and, w and, and us included, thought that fashion brands would do really well. We never expected um, supermarkets and grocers to do as well as they did in terms of engagement. But we want to give an example, don't we, Emily? Yes. <laughs> we want to talk about um, two, two things where we're looking at social media and how people are engaging their audience. And we've got this example here. Yeah, we? so the example that we have on the screen um, from Global Scorecard is Casino, which is um, a French supermarket. Um, so as you can see from the examples given, these are taken from Facebook, and this is looking at Facebook engagement. So you might not notice, um, but at the top, all of these posts were actually posted at 10 a.m. every single morning. Um, so this looks quite automated. And basically, when we were looking through this retailer's um, social media, we could see that they had a lot of automated posts. So really, it's just not having that human-friendly feel that um, users like to see on their social media. Also, um, this retailer in particular actually has over 100,000 followers on Facebook, but as you can see from the engagement, only getting 12, um, five and two likes um, really isn't maximizing on that um, social following. Also, you can see the share number there is a lot lower. So really, what we would like to do, or what we would recommend retailers do, is um, make their social media a lot more user-friendly, a lot more natural, and really try and use it a number of different media um, to be able to reach out and get people to share, basically. Great. And uh, if we just, um, if we nip back, what are the things that we were looking for, Emily, if you wanted to score well? So we were looking at um, we were looking for a clear understanding of the audience's passions. So obviously, in order to reach out and engage with people, you need to join in the conversation that they're already having on social media. Um, educational and inspirational content also really helps with that. And it also links to the search vis visibility I was talking to earlier. Producing great natural content will really help with your search results, and it also helps online. And um, people really appreciate how-to videos and having a different media mix of content. Great. So let's move on to the next area and look at trading. So the question here was, how appealing are you to your audience? And we looked at three things, content and promotion, content you see on the site. We looked at the products, the range, how they were produced. And we looked at things that drive conversion, so payment options and uh, cross-border considerations if you're selling internationally. And uh, what did we find? So how appealing are you to your customers got an average score of 56%, so that was a bit higher than online marketing. Um, it's still pretty low. Yeah, still lots of area for improvement um, in the trading areas that we saw. Yeah. So specifically? Um, so we, um, from a Forrester report actually, um, as well in terms of what we were saying, um, 24 billion sales um, are actually lost due to cross-selling opportunities. So when I talk about cross-selling, I'm meaning the what would you recommend, the different size options on a site that you would get as the user goes through the journey. So you'd have, if I was buying a suit, I'd have a shirt, I'd have some cufflinks, a tie, I might be able to buy the whole look or... Yeah, exactly, and maybe some uh, new shoes as some well, Headley. Shoes. Oh, thank thank <laughs> you, Emily, that's very kind of you. I'll find a different presenter to <laughs> Yeah. Um, two in five um, retailers didn't actually include product reviews either, and I know that this can be a bit of a, um, a touch point for retailers in terms of whether to include negative um, product reviews on product pages. We would recommend that you do, just because it gives a natural feel and a user is much more likely to actually trust those reviews. And obviously, if they're all positive, it gives a bit of a fake message and the, the user might not trust that retailer going forward. Um, and also, only 26% of the retailers scored actually utilized 360 imagery. Um, this is something that's becoming a lot more prominent. Obviously, if you're buying online, you need to really try and recreate that in-store experience. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is using as much technology that's avail available to you. So 360 imagery and videos are really important on product pages. So what were we looking for? So we were looking for um, six high-quality product images. Um, we were also um, looking for the three 60-degree um, imagery that I was talking, and how-to videos. So adding how-to videos to product pages um, can really help the user convert and kind of take them down that decision process in order to buy. And we've seen real uplift for our clients where we've reshot their product photography in 360 where relevant, or just shot it uh, with the relevant kind of looks 
and detail that are important in the buying criteria. So this, these points are really close to our heart, and we know they make people more money. So, um, an example. So, broccoli. So as you can see, this is the product image that Sainsbury's is using to sell broccoli, and you might think that this can't get any better. <laughs> but oh yes, it can. Boom. So, <laughs> The way that Ocado sells their broccoli is in a, lot, is in a different way. So you can see the packaging um, that you would get if you went into store, and you can also see a nice image of, how, like a lifestyle image of how you would um, eat that broccoli. So I'm not sure about you, but I think it makes it a bit more appealing to the customer, and they'd probably get a higher conversion rate on the Ocado product. Mm. And, and I, I just want to say one more thing on this because. We, we see all of the hard work that goes into creating uh, a website, building a trading team, the millions spent on online marketing, all to get the customer to this page. And then we give them an image like that. You know, it's the last mile, it's the cheapest thing. We've spent millions and we can't shoot some better looking broccoli or a product, it's incredible. And often we see retailers go, oh, well, we just haven't got any content, oh, just make, make it up or it's just not very good. And we all know it's not very good. And yet, all of the budget's been spent to get people there. So we, we, we plead uh, with retailers to improve their content and particularly their photography. So well done, Ocado, for making broccoli sexy. So um, what's this, Emily? So this is a heat map. So we work with a number of different retailers already, and as part of that experience, we can actually track where a user clicks on a product page. So the example behind me is actually Carpet Right, which is one of the retailers we work with in the UK, and we can see the clicks um, on the heat map. So uh, if it's more red in color, that's where the user is clicking and engaging most on the page. So as you can see from this example, the images are really, really important, and this just kind of backs up what we were saying. So as you can see along the bottom, the lifestyle images in the left left-hand side are getting a lot of attention. The color options at the top are also getting a lot of um, attention. And then further down, there's actually a calculator. So the user can actually use a calculator to be able to work out how much carpet they would need to uh, decorate their home. And they're the three main areas that are getting the most attention. You can see that the rest of the page isn't really seeing much value. And above the below the fold, sorry, so what the user doesn't see, you can see that they're not necessarily scrolling down to see that content either. Yeah. This is such an important way for, uh, for retailers, and anybody with a website should be using this kind of technique. In some cases, it's either free to implement or it's incredibly cheap. But it gives you an actual view of what people are doing on the page, and it allows you to test whether your theories and whether your beautiful banner that you think everybody wants to click on is even being viewed. In many cases, it's often not. So th this is the kind of uh, technique and analytics that we would recommend everybody who owns and trades a business online to be, uh, have as part of their ritual as an ongoing, every day, every week hygiene. So, um, final question. We asked those 50 global retailers, do you delight your customer? And there were three parts to this. One was about the customer service that was given. So, how responsive were they when we sent them an email and said, uh, we have a question or our order didn't arrive? We also telephoned them. Did they answer the telephone? If they did, what was the kind of reply? And in some cases, it's unprintable, and we, haven't, we couldn't put it into the presentation. Uh, we looked at delivery. Delivery is such an important choice for people. Next day, same day, which time slots? And finally, we looked at returns. How easy was it for people to be able to return the product and where? So, uh, Emily, what did we find? So, as you can see, the average score for do you delight your customers was 60%. Um, so, it wasn't too bad. However, there is definite, definite room for improvement still there. And I, I have to say, again, when I look, because this is the last time we're going to see this slide, just think about this. 50 global retailers, some of the best in the world, uh, and we didn't actually manage to get more than the average of 65% in any category. So, I, I, there's... I'm, I was quite surprised by that, but also um, there's a huge room for improvement and there's clearly lost money on the table. And it's easy to get it back. So I, I think those scores could be, could be a lot higher. Anyway, what were we looking for here? So within the logistics and service, um, we saw that 60% of the retailers scored did not offer free returns. So this is something that can be really frustrating to a, re um, a shopper. Um, obviously, if you can't offer a free returns, especially for non-food, so clothes items, that kind of thing. Um, I myself usually order about 
three things in the different colors. I'm a retailer's nightmare, but I'm just an average shopper. Um, and having a free returns option is definitely something that I would look for when I'm purchasing. You're exactly the kind of customer that retailers don't want, aren't you? I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep, that is me. Five pairs of shoes and <laughs> keep none of them. We also saw that less than half um, of the retailers scored were able to offer seven days delivery. So this is something that's becoming more and more popular, especially if you look at um, some of the grocers. So um, shoppers' expectations are just getting higher and higher, and being able to have that convenient service seven days a week is really important. Again, um, this for convenience for the users, we saw that 26% um, of the retailers scored do not offer um, same or next day delivery. And we've, we found that throughout the um, buying journey, not having that option can actually reduce conversion rate. OK. And what were we looking for? So we were looking for free delivery, um, next day, same day, click and collect options. So this is something that's become more and more popular for users to be able to order online and then actually go in and collect in store if it's easy for them. Basically, anything as part of this um, journey just to make it really convenient for the user. Yeah. Some examples. Um, so, convenient delivery options. So, um, the example that you can see on the screen is Blackmores. So, um, as you can see, the shipping method here is just standard. There isn't any other option to have another um, delivery, and it also doesn't tell you when you'll get your delivery. So, I don't know by ordering standard when my purchase is going to arrive. Um, and it also um, doesn't tell you how much that standard delivery is actually going to cost. As opposed to? So when you look at Sainsbury's, you can see that they have home delivery and click and collect options, and they highlight absolutely everything as part of their delivery option, and they're really using that as a USP um, to push them forwards and really get those loyal customers coming back to them. Great. So how can we become better online? You know, there's a very simple um, sentence we put, put, put up on the, uh, the slide there, which says, remember that even online, you are still selling to a human being. It was quite amazing at times when you're shopping across 50 retailers that they appeared to at times uh, completely forget there was a human behind the screen wanting to place an order. And often it was clear that the technical limitations and implications were now in the way of everything that people were trying to do. Pages looked like they'd been written by developers, not customer experience experts. And we'd lost all sight of you know, common sense, like the example with Blackmore standard, what on earth does that mean? So f for us, um, understanding the customer experience and what they want is, is key. So how do we become better online? There are three simple things I would hope that retailers should consider. One, make it easy for customers. It's a really simple thing. Challenge complexity all the time, every day. How do you make your shopping experience as easy as possible? And I suggest there's one brilliant, simple test. Try ordering on your website on your mobile phone while you're driving. If you can do that, you've probably got quite an easy process. Or maybe don't do that. Well, <laughs> but try it. I promise you, you won't be able to do it if you have to fill in your name and address without autofill. <laughs> the second thing is keep your customers in control. As we saw from those videos, the customer wants to know when, where. As soon as they feel out of control or nervous, they are, have a high likelihood of abandonment. There's a whole psychology about the state of mind when people come to a website. It's an ambiguous process. They don't know really where to look. They, have, they come with expectations. As soon as you... As soon as you contradict those expectations or make it in any way difficult, you've now got people who are very likely to leave. Keep them in control. And finally, ensure your top of mind. We, all day, all morning, we talked about social media, the rise of digital and importance in our lives. It seems like an obvious comment, but it was just extraordinary how retailers that we measured had completely forgotten to make sure that they were all over the internet for the things that they were selling with millions of people looking and searching, why wouldn't you be there? So make sure you're top of mind in front of your customers and the right ones. Three simple questions. So thank you very much. I hope um, you've enjoyed what we've had to say. Emily, thank you very much and all your hard work and scorecard. Um, we are available uh, to talk to you uh, now. I'm going to ask, uh, open the floor for some questions. Um, also, come and see us um, over in Showcase. 
uh, we have turned Scorecard into a game where we ask you 10 questions and you can lose or make money for a fictional business. So come and try your hand. It will either have you updating your LinkedIn profile or asking for a promotion. Um, but do come and try the Scorecard game, which will bring this alive. Secondly, if you're interested in a, a more detailed conversation about um, how we scored you, if you feature in the report and you would like your score, we'd love to share it with you. And secondly, maybe you're not in the report, um, but you'd like us to score you and tell you something about your competitors. Very happy to do that too. So let's open the floor for any questions. One at a time, please. <laughs> right, well, that must say, that must have been as clear as daylight then. <laughs> Great, thank you very much indeed, everybody.